Hello, welcome to our webinar today on the proposed Canadian Impact Assessment Act presented by Christine Lothbaum. My name is Bridget John and I'll be your moderator. Today's webinar is hosted by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. We are the leading global network on best practice in using impact assessment to make informed decisions. Today's presentation is part of a webinar program we initiated last year. And I invite you to visit our website and check out the recordings of a few of our recent webinars. We've had webinars on health impact assessment, indigenous voices in IA, uh, social psychosocial impact assessment, resettlement. And you'll see the link there. You can view recordings on demand as you would like. And our next webinar will be next Monday, March 19th, on reforming the environmental permit and review process using a case study from El Salvador. So tune in, get registered. It should be an interesting webinar. Before we begin, just a few pieces of housekeeping. We are indeed recording this webinar and we will make it available afterwards. You'll receive an email in a day or two with the link. There will be time at the end for questions for Christine. So please enter any questions at any time in the box on your control panel on the right side of your screen. The slides are available under handouts and there's also uh, another handout, a PDF you can download, um, technical guide of, of the proposed system. So you can download that. Both the questions and the handouts pane are in the, are gray on the right side in your dashboard. So enter questions at any time and we'll take them at the end. Our presenter today is, as I said, Christine Lothbaum. Christine is the Vice President of the Policy Development Sector at the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency. She's responsible for a legislative policy and regulatory direction for the agency. Christine has 22 years of experience in policy development and program implementation. Holding senior roles at the Canadian Tourism Commission and at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Christine has led the development of many strategic policy initiatives and corporate planning frameworks. She's also managed and coordinated a number of federal horizontal policy frameworks, including Canada's Ocean Strategy and Gathering Strength, Canada's Aboriginal Action Plan. Christine holds a Master of Arts in Canadian Studies from Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, and a Bachelor of Arts in Canadian Studies and Political Science from Glendon College at York University in Toronto, Ontario. We're really happy to have you, Christine, and so grateful that you agreed to present this webinar on a very timely topic. And at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Bridget. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, today, we're gonna to give you an overview of the proposed uh, impact assessment legislation, a bit of the context and some other consultations going on. Uh, this piece of legislation is a proposed piece of legislation that's currently in the parliamentary approval process here in Canada. And uh, so we'll also give you an update on that uh, process. So just to give you some background context, on February 8th of this year, the Minister for Environment and Climate Change tabled Bill C-69. This bill proposes to repeal the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act of 2012 and replace it with the Impact Assessment Act. The proposed act sets out a federal process for impact assessment of major projects and the prevention of significant adverse environmental effects for projects on federal lands and outside of Canada. The proposed uh, bill builds on 14 months of active consultation across uh, the country, both through an expert panel, the Minister for Environment and Climate Change, and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency. The proposed act seeks to reflect the feedback that was received over this extensive consultation period, and it would represent, if passed, a significant shift in Canada to how assessments are conducted. Most significantly, the shift would move from environmental assessment to impact assessment, with a single agency responsible for conducting impact assessment in Canada. That agency is proposed to be a, a, a renewed version of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency that would move to the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada. The scope of assessments would broaden to include environmental, social, health, and economic impacts. And there's the addition of an early, inclusive, and meaningful public engagement. In the feedback that was received, 
there was a strong emphasis placed on certainty and predictability of the process. So the system that is proposed does seek to do this through legislative timelines and is well consistent with priorities of the Canadian government on renewed and relationships and reconciliation in nation to nation, Inuit crown and government to government, with strong emphasis on Indigenous peoples running throughout the legislation, and we'll talk about some of those slides going forward. In addition, there's a strong foundation within the legislation to ensure that decisions are based on science and Indigenous traditional knowledge and increase legislative uh, enabling functions for regional and strategic assessments to support impact assessments. The slide that you see now lays out a stepwise process for uh, the proposed impact assessment system. We've provided a link, as well as Bridget mentioned at the beginning, to a technical guide. This technical guide uh, seeks to provide a, a more plain language version to be able to understand this complex piece of legislation. And this five-step process seeks to lay out how the enabling functions of the Act would be applied and how the system is proposed to function. I'd like to note that the technical guide that you've received a copy of lays out not just the legislative commitments, but also policy and regulatory commitments that would need to be fulfilled in order to put this uh, system, proposed system, fully into place. So just to lay out uh, five steps here, as I had noted, it's significant that there's an early planning step that is a new step that is added to the process. We'll talk about some of that. Uh, the impact assessment, uh, impact statement step, for the proponent would replace the uh, environmental impact guideline step, impact assessment either led by the agency or by a review panel, of course decision making, and then follow up and monitoring. You'll see in the icons at the bottom left how public participation, cooperation with other jurisdictions, and engagement with Indigenous peoples are strong collaborative working together models that run through all steps in the process. In terms of early engagement, I want to talk about that, that new step and what the provisions uh, lay out in the legislation. So within the current system under CIA 2012, there is no mandatory early planning and engagement phase. And throughout the, pro the consultation process, government heard strongly from proponents uh, that you know, good proponents are out there doing good planning, and they heard strongly from the public, from Indigenous groups, that they want an opportunity to be out there early and to have the government stepping in early to be able to facilitate some of that dialogue and ensure that people have an opportunity to get their issues on the table and to understand how they will be engaged throughout the process. This new phase seeks to do that. It is a legislated timeline of 180 days. And it would propose to begin when the proponent provides an initial description of a proposed project, laying out some baseline information about the project and discussing what work that they have done up to date to engage in dialogue and discussions with those who may be impacted by the project. The government would be stepping in early through the impact assessment agency, to continue that early, in early dialogue with Indigenous peoples. It would be here in the early planning process, but there would be opportunities identified to cooperate and collaborate with other jurisdictions, including provinces, territories, and indigenous jurisdictions. And it would be here that issues would be raised early, leading to better project design so that, uh, so that indigenous groups, stakeholders, and the public have an opportunity to put issues forward and a proponent understands those issues and information that it will be called upon to include in an impact assessment. There are three very important outcomes of this early and planning phase. First is an impact assessment cooperation plan that would include an Indigenous engagement and partnership plan that will be developed collaboratively with Indigenous people to identify uh, the, how they would be involved, who would be involved, and the methods in which engagement and consultation would take place as well as a public participation plan. And this cooperation plan would also outline any opportunities for collaborative or joint work with other jurisdictions. 
An important output from this phase is also tailored impact statement guidelines. Feedback that was received was that the current um, environmental impact guidelines tend to be more generic in nature, and the proposal is that a proponent would have a tailored impact statement guidelines so that we can thereby alleviate uh, questions and issues that may arise later in the process and to get as much clarity and certainty as possible up front and early in the process about the baseline studies, information, data, and participation that would be required for the assessment. And finally, there would be a permitting plan if requested to lay out in addition to the impact assessment what other regulatory permits a proponent would be required uh, to seek from other federal authorities or provincial and territorial authorities in order if if if, uh, if it's a joint uh, review in, in order to streamline the overall uh, impact assessment and regulatory process. As I noted, there's a significant proposed shift in the legislation to move from environmental assessment to a broadened scope of impact assessment with a strong focus on the principle of sustainability. The scope of assessments would shift to include both the positive and negative environmental, economic, and social and health impacts. And section 22 of the proposed uh, legislation lays out a broad set of factors that includes requirements as well to consider additional traditional knowledge, community knowledge, and gender-based analysis so that a holistic and integrated decision-making process take place. Building on feedback received through the consultation process, there's a strong focus to ensure regulatory certainty for all parties involved in the assessment process. As I noted earlier, the proposed legislation moves from three responsible authorities under the current CIA 2012 to have a single agency, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, conducting assessments and coordinating Crown consultations with Indigenous peoples. Where there are assessments that involve life cycle regulators, those being the current res responsible authorities in the National Energy Board, which is proposed to become the Canadian Energy Regulator, and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, those organizations, as well as offshore boards looking at development in the offshore, would work collaboratively with the agency to provide expertise as needed. These are proposed to be panel assessments, that would be led by the agency working in collaboration with those life cycle regulators. As I noted, the current CIA uh, 2012 has legislative timelines. There was a lot of feedback within the public consultation period to ensure that legislative timelines continue throughout the process in order to provide that certainty and predictability of process. So legislative timelines are proposed to be maintained. There's an addition of the 180-day legislative timeline for early planning, and the timelines for the assessment process are also proposed in the legislation to be reduced. In the case of agency-led assessments, from 365 days to 300 days. In the case of panel assessments, from 720 days to 600 days. These legislative timelines are proposed to be managed through a regulation. And the uh, Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency currently has a consultation paper out and available to consult on the information requirements for the process, as well as how the timelines uh, would be managed. There's also an ability for the minister to set the timeline for assessment at the out outset and adjust those timelines in order to facilitate a harmonized process. Some of the feedback that it was received through the consultation process is that due to some of the inflexibility of the current legislative timelines, it's often difficult to collaborate with other jurisdictions. So having that flexibility built in there to be able to harmonize and thereby promote a one project, one assessment that has greater benefits for all involved, there is an ability to adjust those timelines. It's laid out further uh, in the consultation paper, but the principle is that if timelines were to be adjusted beyond the legislative timeline framework, 
there needs to be a rationale that's provided for that decision, and that needs to be posted publicly available. In the past, as I've indicated, uh, there, there was a generic review guidelines that guided the assessment process, and I noted that the tailored impact assessment guidelines are a key output of the, uh, of the early planning process that will help to bring certainty to the process so that all involved have the ability to raise key issues early in the process and provides proponents with the clarity uh, to be able to respect those expectations from the outset and to know what type of information upon which they'll be assessed and to have ample time to bring that information forward. Consistent with the Government of Canada's priority on rights and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, there are a number of places within the legislation that support reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Moving from uh, Indigenous participation in reviews driven by the duty to consult to moving towards aiming to secure consent through processes based on the recognition of rights. Rights would be, a, would be acknowledged at the outset of the process, and there are explicit requirements to consult and cooperate before an assessment has begun through the early planning process. The agency would be looking to work to develop the, that Indigenous engagement and partnership plan in cooperation with Indigenous people. Historically, there were limited uh, op options for cooperation with Indigenous governments, and the proposed legislation includes an expanded definition of Indigenous jurisdiction, and it enables opportunities for Indigenous governments to seek to exercise powers and duties under the Act, including substitution. The Act lays out the ability to do this through a regulation, and through that regulation, which would define the types of agreements that the agency can enter into uh, with Indigenous people, Indigenous governments can seek to draw down powers from under the Act. There's also collaboration on assessments and ongoing monitoring, and the opportunity for Indigenous-led monitoring committees. The previous legislation was silent on the consideration of Indigenous rights in the EA process, and the proposed legislation has requirements to address the impacts of Indigenous rights in decision-making. Specifically, the Minister has the power to designate projects, and as well in the, agent, in the agency decision and the ministerial and uh, potentially cabinet decision, there's a public interest test at the end. And the public interest test includes looking at the impact on Indigenous rights and providing clarity in the rationale for the decision making on how the rights are impacted. Continuing the vein of participant funding that has been available for project consultations, there's a commitment to increase that support for Indigenous participation and capacity development through increased participant funding and also funding to support greater uh, capacity development uh, for Indigenous organizations and participant participation in project assessments. There will also be that support will become available as early as the early planning phase. CIA 2012. Uh, indicates that Indigenous traditional knowledge may be considered by a proponent, whereas the proposed legislation imposes a mandatory consideration of Indigenous traditional knowledge and also seeks to protect that Indigenous traditional knowledge uh, if provided alongside other sources of evidence. There will be further policy work that will be done in collaboration with Indigenous people in order to develop a policy around Indigenous knowledge and the further protection of that indigenous traditional knowledge. The proposed impact assessment and the programs and policies that will be developed in order to put the enabling legislation into place seek to move to a co-development of policies of interest to indigenous peoples. As I noted, traditional knowledge, indigenous cooperation regulations, and the policy framework to put those into place. In addition, the legislation has a clear requirement for the establishment of an Indigenous Advisory Committee 
to work with the agency on policy and technical guidance on issues of concern to Indigenous peoples. Throughout the legislation, there are enhancements to public participation, starting right even from the purposes section of the Act to ensure meaningful and open public participation. Participation historically was, uh, was limited uh, in review panels to interested parties. And I would also note that under the uh, proposed Canadian Energy Regulator Act, there is a proposal to uh, remove the standing test, that, that standing test uh, that is currently in the NEB Act, no longer uh, in, the, in the Canadian Energy Regulator proposed act. And the interested party definition is removed from the proposed impact assessment act thereby opening up the public participation opportunities for Canadians to participate in impact assessment. Public participation opportunities like Indigenous engagement consultation opportunities commence right from the early planning stage with the development of that very important public participation plan. Under CIA 2012, there's an limited amount of information that's posted on the registry around an assessment. Throughout the consultation process, there was considerable feedback heard about the need to include increased levels of information on the SIA registry and to provide a greater access to, the, to that information. Under the proposed legislation, there are provisions to increase uh, the access to that information and to increase the, the project file and the access to the, you know, all the information in the project file and make that available. Uh, for example, if a federal expert department has undertaken a scientific analysis of a study that the proponent has done, that analysis or assessment would in the future be made available on the registry website. In addition to the participant funding program being expanded for Indigenous people, it is also proposed to be expanded to include broader eligible activities for the public. Consistent with the Government of Canada's uh, commitment to enhancing science and evidence-based knowledge for decision-making, there are strong themes of evidence-based knowledge and decision-making and transparency that run throughout various different sections of the proposed legislation. The legislation proposes to establish as well an expert advisory committee on science and knowledge support the agency in moving forward on uh, project assessments and the guidance and technical documents that support its implementation. As well, there will be greater uh, development of plain language summaries in order to increase the accessibility of complex scientific and technical information. And there will be a requirement to post the rationale for decisions. Some strong feedback that was heard throughout the consultation process is that oftentimes individuals are challenged to see the rationale from the, that runs from the assessment process and the report to the decision making. So the legislation lays out the requirement for the minister and or cabinet to post a rationale for the decisions that they're taking. In addition, the decisions uh, on projects are guided by science, evidence, and traditional knowledge. And the government uh, across the federal reviews, including that of the Impact Assessment Act, the Canadian and Energy Regulator, Fisheries Act, and the Transport Act will be working on together on an open science and data platform to provide a greater level of access to information related to cumulative impacts, impact assessments, and the regulatory process. As I noted earlier, there's mandatory consideration and protection of Indigenous traditional knowledge and federal and when needed independent reviews of science. So throughout the legislation consistent with CIA 2012, this legislation proposes that federal expert uh, departments will continue to do assessments of science and bring uh, knowledge and their expertise to bear on impact assessment in support of the agency. In addition to that, the legislation proposes that where needed, uh, where there may be uh, questions arising from some of that, there is the ability to bring in an independent review of a proponent science if necessary. 
spoken a little bit about decision making where this goes into a bit more detail in terms of the decision making frame for the proposed legislation also notes a significant shift. In CIA 2012, decisions were based on whether or not a project is likely to cause significant adverse environmental effects and whether or not those effects were justified. In the proposed Impact Assessment Act, the decision shifts to a public interest decision. So the decision is whether adverse effects are in the public interest and specifically looks at the decision-making rationale for that public interest in the areas of the, de the designated project's contribution to sustainability, the extent to which the impact, it potential impacts are, met, are mitigated, and the measures that a proponent would propose to take to mitigate those impacts, the impacts on Indigenous peoples and rights, and finally, the impact on the Government of Canada's environmental obligations and climate change commitments. Throughout the process, there are two types of assessments. Proposed, the first assessments are those conducted by the Impact Assessment Agency, where the Minister of Environment and Climate Change will be the decision maker to decide the public interest determination on those assessments, with the ability to seek a cabinet approval and concurrence for those decisions. Where there are panel-led assessments, and those panels uh, could be joint panels with another jurisdiction, or they could be agency-led panels and panels done in cooperation with life cycle regulators. Panel decisions would move to cabinet or governor and council decision. And those would also be a public interest decision based on the factors noted here on this slide and the rationale for either a ministerial decision or a cabinet decision will be publicly posted and available. A key determinant, obviously, of the impact assessment system is what types of projects are subject to the Impact Assessment Act and warrant a full impact assessment by the agency. Under CIA 2012, the determination of whether a proposed project needs to have an assessment conducted is determined by the regulation designated, designating physical activities. This regulation is more commonly known as the project list regulation. It is proposed that this regulation designating physical activities or the project list regulation would remain the vehicle that determines whether or not a particular project would be subject to impact assessment. And this regulation is currently being reviewed under this process in order to look at whether or not there need to be projects that are added to the list, removed for the list, or whether conditions or thresholds that determine a project on the list need to be adjusted. The government is has, at the same time, as launching the proposed impact assessment legislation, has also launched, launched a consultation on this regulation. You will see the link here on the slide, and we can provide it uh, in the future, to a consultation paper seeking to uh, get feedback on the criteria and methodology that would be used to review the proposed, uh, the regulation designating physical activities. It's proposed as a criteria-based approach to use to look at this regulation and that projects that have the most potential for adverse environmental effects in the areas of federal jurisdiction as well will be looked at uh, within the, the project list as well. In addition to the project list determining what projects would be subject to the Impact Assessment Act, the minister may also designate any project that is not prescribed in the reg regulations. That, uh, that provision exists under CIA 2012 and would continue uh, into the future. As I noted, this is a proposed piece of legislation and it was uh, tabled uh, in the House of Commons in February. It has undergone first and second reading in the House of Commons. 
and is awaiting a to finalize second reading. Since uh, the House of Commons is currently on a break, it's anticipated that that vote will take place when they return next week. Following the vote after second reading, the proposed uh, legislation would move towards a review by committee. The Parliamentary Committee for Environment and Sustainable Development will be the committee that is that will be reviewing this piece of legislation. The link to their site is included here within this slide. The committee uh, is currently opened up to seek expressions of interest uh, from those who want to comment on the bill or want to provide written submissions to the committee for their consideration. That concludes the overview that I have of the Proposed Impact Assessment Act. There were some questions that were included uh, in the, I guess came as a result of the invitation and registration for the uh, webinar. And I can start by responding to some of those questions. While at the same time, as Bridget noted, we are open uh, for additional questions. Bridget, did you just want to go over to folks how they can send uh, in additional questions for us to look at and consider as well? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Christine, for the presentation and the overview. Uh, we've been experiencing lots of, we have lots of questions already. Uh, if you want to send more or if you haven't sent one in yet in the dashboard of your control panel, there is a questions pane and you can just um, open that by clicking on the triangle and sending in your question that way. Do you want to go over the questions uh, from the registration or do you want me to just start asking your questions, Christine? Um, however you'd like to proceed, Bridget. All right. Well, let's start with a question that we received uh, online in advance from Vicki. She's wondering about the transition process, Christine. Will proponents currently in the EA process under CA 2012 requirements be expected to reflect the upcoming changes to the process in advance of their actual implementation via legislative and policy change? And she's wondering how evolving expectations will be met. Great. Well, thanks, Vicki, for the question. So the current legislation, CIA 2012, is in place until the parliamentary process is completed and, uh, and whether the bill receives royal assent and a coming into four states uh, is identified. So proponents who are currently in the system until royal assent and coming into force will continue to have assessments conducted under CIA 2012 and they would be reviewed with that legislation as well as the interim principles framework that the government put in place since January of 2016. The proposed impact assessment act does lay out transition provisions for proponents and those will be dealt with further in operational guidance. If there are uh, organizations, individuals, proponents that have questions uh, you know, on specific projects, our operations team can be working with those proponents to, to outline any questions that they have. Okay. John asks, how can the scope of a federal impact assessment include social health and economic effects and, more importantly, enforce any ensuing conditions of approval when these are within provincial jurisdiction and who may disagree? Okay. Um, thanks for that question, John. So it's important to note that a federal impact assessment can look at any number of health, social, cultural, uh, economic factors. So you can bring uh, many different factors into the actual assessment and look at a broad range of scope. However, the decision needs to be uh, very closely related to a federal jurisdiction so that those uh, impacts uh, that are determined in the public interest need to be within an area of federal jurisdiction. And the design around the project list as well has a strong lens on it to ensure that projects that uh, are being looked at within the, the project list regulation are within an area of federal jurisdiction. I'd also like to note that within the proposed uh, Impact Assessment Act, as well as under the current assessment process, there's a strong uh, intent to work collaboratively with other jurisdictions, provinces, and territories, 
and where there's a theme of one project and one assessment to try to move to cooperation. And of course, uh, we work closely with provinces and territories to build on their knowledge for uh, social uh, health impacts and many of their pieces of legislation currently have uh, impact assessment, broader scope, sustainability type of assessments, and we'll be working with them to learn from that as we build this process going forward. All right, Peter is asking about SEA and says he notes that impact assessment will be legislated, but he understands that SEA is still to be done ad hoc and is wondering why that is. Uh, there are actually provisions within uh, the legislation to uh, legislate strategic environmental assessments. And uh, the minister is enabled through the legislation to be able to ask the impact assessment agency to undertake a strategic uh, assessment. And at the same time that this legislation was launched, it was also noted that uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada will actually be undertaking one of the first strategic assessments and they will be undertaking a strategic assessment of climate change. And the outcome of that strategic assessment will provide uh, guidance to uh, federal government as well as proponents on how climate impacts should be looked at within a project assessment context. Nick asks who manages or leads the early planning phase, the proponent or impact assessment act? So the impact of the early planning phase starts with the proponent notifying that the impact assessment agency that uh, there's a project underway. The Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, that's the trigger for the organization to actually you know, step in and start to actively manage the process. There are uh, clear rules and responsibilities outlined in the technical document attached uh, that tell you what are the agency's responsibilities, the proponent's responsibilities at every phase in the process. So I, I do note that as an important document for folks uh, to take a look at. In this case, in the early uh, engagement phase, there are strong requirements for the agency to start early consultations and engagement to go out and meet with folks to verify the information that's coming in from the proponent and to work collaboratively on the development of the uh, three products that are the output of that process. And uh, the proponent is always invited to participate or, uh, with the agency in those uh, early engagement sessions as appropriate as well. Marla comments that the handbook that accompanies the bill is wonderfully clear. However, there are a number of things that appear in the handbook that are not in the bill itself, like the concept of indigenous and community monitoring and the open science and data platform. Great ideas, she says, but since these aren't in the bill itself, where is the certainty that they will occur? So the Indigenous monitoring requirements, there is a, a provision uh, within the legislation that enables uh, the agency administrator to set up those types of monitoring committees. So that enabling provision is in the legislation. And then, uh, as noted, some of the things outlined in the technical guide are also some of the policy work that needs to be done to further to put that in place. So there is an enabling provision that allows us to set up those committees, and there's uh, funding in the capacity and indigenous engagement to support them, and then we'll do further policy work to help uh, define those and learn from best practices. Peter asks if the new act as proposed requires mandatory human health impact assessment and human rights impact assessment, such as right to clean air, water, and soil, for projects in proximity to human settlements like towns, cities, reserves, and important aquifers? So those are great elements to raise. There's still much policy work that needs to be done to look at the components of health that would be included uh, in, a, in an assessment framework. And to further develop that, there's more policy work to come in collaboration with Health Canada, and also, as I noted, to learn from provinces, territories, and other jurisdictions, domestic or international, that currently look at these elements. So more to come uh, on that. The legislation provides the enabling framework, and now we need to work on the policy elements to put that into place. 
John asks if legislated timelines will be subject to stop clock time by a repeated series of information requests. So the legislated timelines will be managed by the inf proposed information and time management regulation. As I noted, there's a consultation paper out right now. And in that consultation paper, it seeks to outline the criteria under which the clocks could be stopped. Criteria such as uh, a proponent asked for it to be stopped. Uh, there is a significant uh, piece of evidence that's uh, required that uh, wasn't known at the early planning phase. And there are a few other uh, criteria conditions within that paper as well. However, as I noted, one of the major outputs of the early planning phase is to develop tailored impact assessment guidelines. And the idea is to ensure that those guidelines are very fulsome and substantive at the outset so that we can seek to avoid uh, later in the process requirements to go out and seek additional information. Al wants to know if you could explain how the government will determine a project's contribution to sustainability. So that there is more uh, policy work that will need to be done to establish that framework. And uh, in doing so, we'll be working with other jurisdictions. And as I noted on the health impact assessment uh, framework as well, looking to other jurisdictions, domestic, domestically or internationally, that look at sustainability. There's much written on this from which we can glean. And we'll be doing additional policy work uh, between now and the, and the time that in, when and if the proposed legislation comes into force. Neil asks if linear pipelines will automatically be assessed by a panel instead of the new IAA. So uh, linear uh, pipelines on the project list that would have trans transboundary implications and would meet the requirements uh, in the regulation would, yes, be done by the impact assessment agency in collaboration with the life cycle regulator, being the proposed Canadian energy regulator. The decisions uh, would be done by a panel. The process would be led by a panel, sorry, and the decisions would be made by cabinet. Uh, could uh, additional permitting be required after the early planning stage? Paula would like to know. So consistent with the uh, existing process, uh, this the proposed impact assessment process remains the same in that the impact assessment determines the whether the uh, impacts proposed are in the public interest, thereby green lighting uh, the project to a certain extent. And then, yes, a proponent would be required to seek any additional regulatory permits, either at the federal level or provincial or territorial jurisdiction, in order to proceed with actually putting the, the project into place on the ground. That's consistent with the existing process. That will continue into the future. As noted, one of the important uh, outputs of the early planning process is to be able to identify that permitting plan so that all involved have a clear understanding of what all the legislative and regulatory requirements a proponent would have to undertake in order to, to put uh, the project into place. We have a couple questions related to the expert panel's reports and recommendations. Jackie's asking, I was talking about the recommendation of the panel that impact statements be developed by a government-led group of experts during the study stage, um, and says this recommendation was consistent with the goal of improving public trust in the assessment process. The proposed bill leaves proponents in, in charge of developing impact statements with the government assessing the statements and providing a final report. Could you comment on the rationale for not adopting this recommendation? So the, the government's uh, proposed impact assessment legislation was based on input received from expert panels, with this expert panel, uh, and, uh, and there were additional expert panels and parliamentary committees, as well as 14 months of consultation. The proposed legislation seeks to strike a balance between all the input uh, that was received from the government, and the decision was taken to have the proponent, who knows the project best, to, to continue uh, to develop the impact statement. However, as I noted, the impact assessment agency, as well as uh, the public, 
stakeholders, indigenous groups have an opportunity through early planning to participate earlier in the process and help to shape the guidelines, the tailored guidelines for that impact assessment statement process. Al is asking if the agency will develop the plain language summaries or will the proponent be doing that? Um, more to come on the, the actual, you know, uh, on that one. There will be a strong role for the agency uh, to do that. However, if someone would have provided us with a plain language summary, I think we would take it. <laughs> <laughs> Deborah's asking, how will the depth of consultation with First Nations be determined? Will there be any changes to the government's strength of claim assessment? So uh, there is also the rights and reconciliation uh, framework that the government has launched, uh, I believe it was a week following the tabling of this legislation. And so we will continue to work uh, with other federal organizations, Department of Justice and uh, CERNA to look at how uh, rights will be assessed in this process and more policy work to come on that. Cheryl asks about regional and strategic assessments and how they fit in the impact assessment process. She said there seems to be very little actual detail on RIA and SIA and assume this affects the timelines currently being considered. So the legislation enables uh, the minister to uh, seek to have an SIA undertaken, as I noted earlier, or a, a regional impact assessment undertaken as well. It also continues the ability for regional studies to be undertaken, which uh, existed previously. An important component of the early planning process is the mandatory consideration of any regional impact assessment or strategic impact assessment that is in existence. And uh, there is a, uh, a commitment to actually undertake, look uh, to seek partners to undertake regional impact assessments going forward. Right. Uh, Isabel asks, how will the calls for public consultations be announced? Uh, I've just called for public consultations. I'm not quite sure on, on what specifically Isabel is referring to, but I will just note that the Parliamentary Committee has already out uh, their call and their invitation for those individuals that want to appear as witnesses or to have submissions on the proposed legislation to the committee. So that's already out, available on the committee's website, link provided in the presentation. And then with respect to public consultations on uh, the proposed information and time management regulation and the proposed changes for the regulation to designate uh, physical activities, those consultation papers are out already. Uh, and available on the agency website or further links can be provided. Uh, Matt has a question going back to a question a couple of ago regarding uh, regional and strategic assessments and how you mentioned that uh, you would incorporate those to support impact assessments. Would the IAC be involved in the development of these assessments? So the um, impact assessment agency may be the body that leads a regional impact assessment, or we may be seeking to work a collaboration with others who are undertaking those, they may be joint partnerships. Uh, I think the form and the shape of different assessments uh, can be flexible, but also, as I said, have the ability to continue study regional studies as well. So yes, there'd be strong involvement of the impact assessment agency, but I, I don't think that would may, that may not be the only body that might be looking at regional impact assessments. David said it doesn't look like the Species at Risk Act was considered in the new legislation in the same way as the Fisheries Act and Migratory Birds Convention Act. Can you speak on the rationale for this, even though SARA is federal jurisdiction? So in the uh, consultation paper that looks at uh, the proposed framework for revising the regulation on physical activities, the project list regulation, it talks about the importance of impact scenarios of federal jurisdiction, including migratory birds uh, or uh, significant areas where there are species at risk. So that frame will still be very important to assessing whether a project is subject to this impact assessment legislation. And uh, for the Species at Risk Act itself, 
Uh, it's an act uh, that stands alone and the uh, federal regulatory reviews that were committed to I did not include that act at this time. It was just the Fisheries Act, Navigation Protection Act, the NEB Act, and the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. All right, Jeff asks how the proposed act improves, how does the proposed act improve the ability and timing for the IA agency to harmonize projects with a province? So the proposed legislation allows for flexibility of timelines and for the minister to be able to adjust those, to be able to harmonize with another jurisdiction. One of the criticisms of CIA 2012 was that there was no ability to adjust the legislative timelines, so it thereby inhibited harmonization and cooperation. A strong theme that runs throughout the legislation is to try where possible to seek uh, one project, one assessment, cooperation and harmonization uh, with other jurisdictions. Caroline says that federal funding flowing to indigenous communities has been historically slow. What measures have been taken to make this process more expedient? So the agency will continue with public participation funding and uh, even throughout the course of the reviews, we were working collaboratively with other federal departments to try to streamline the, the funding process as well as look for opportunities for more one window uh, funding coming from the federal government. We will continue to seek to try to, uh, to streamline that and to have one window uh, funding opportunities for regulatory and impact assessment purposes. Okay. Uh, is there any impact assessment on the economy caused by the new piece of legislation being carried out? Asks Juliana. I'm not sure I completely understand that question, Bridget. Okay. Um, I could, I don't know if you uh, want to repeat it? Or, I'll repeat it. Yep. Is there any or impact assessment? Is there any assessment? clarity that she can provide through the text box? Yeah, Juliana, if there's any additional information you want to provide, um, I'll read it again. Is there any impact assessment on the economy caused by the new piece of legislation? Is there an impact assessment being carried out on the economy that's being caused by the new piece of legislation? I would just note that uh, the impact assessment process, uh, as outlined, seeks to have a broader assessment of impacts, including social, health, environmental, and economic impacts. So economic impacts will be looked at as part of each project assessment. Okay. Caroline also asks if we're able, if they are able to distribute the handouts provided today. Is there any reason that they could not? Uh, no, all those handouts are publicly available on our website, and uh, we've developed them because we want people to have a, a good understanding of the proposed legislation, so please circulate those widely. All right. Uh, Trevor asked, will all designated projects that were formerly reviewed by the CNSC under SIA be reviewed by a panel? Uh, yes, all, all projects uh, currently done by responsible authorities the NED and the CNSC will now be panels. The Impact Assessment Agency will lead the panel review process and do so building uh, in collaboration with those organizations, leveraging their expertise and knowledge. Michael asks if you could explain a bit further on any cost recovery provisions and how it will work in practice. So yes, there are cost recovery provisions in the legislation. Uh, more uh, work to come on those into the future. Uh, Tim asks how the agency will reconcile shortened timelines with its augmented mandate, and will this present capacity issues for the agency? Uh, consistent with the uh, announcement of the proposed legislation, and uh, you will have noted just following that, a budget announcement that the federal government is investing up to $1 billion over the next five years to support the various different federal departments, including the agency, to put in place this new system. So there is a significant funding uh, uh, commitment from the federal government to put the implement the system. And uh, there, the legislative timelines with the advent of early planning and the relationship building as well as the identification of the information. Uh, there's a, you know, a sentiment that it will help to streamline uh, the process. Uh, Kelly asks if you, uh, she says she'd like to know more about the decision making process under, for example, under what circumstances could a project be found to meet various tests, uh, but then the minister decides against it. 
Well, the, the, the decision-making process will be built on the impact assessment report. So if it's an agency-led assessment or a panel-led assessment, they would look at the factors outlined in Section 22 of the proposed Act. Uh, there's about 21 different factors within that section that would require to be assessed and included within the report. Uh, the minister would take that report into consideration and then the final decision would be a public interest test and that public interest test there would be a requirement uh, to outline a rationale for the decision and the rationale for the decision would need to take into consideration the factors that were outlined on the slide on decision making and uh, the minister when taking a decision or cabinet if it's a panel decision is it would require to be a transparent about the rationale for their decision. Anne is asking if there will be a process to follow project implementation to assure that necessary mitigation measures are properly implemented. So mitigation measures are one of the uh, factors to look at public interest, what mitigation measures are in place, mitigation measures and conditions, laid out in decision statements would continue to be the vehicle. So when taking a decision, the minister, uh, once a decision is taken, would issue a decision statement. That decision statement would include conditions of a project. The proponent would thereby re be required to ensure that those conditions are met. The agency and or the appropriate federal regulatory body would manage and monitor those conditions for which it's responsible. And there's compliance and enforcement provisions within the legislation to ensure that those conditions are met. It's important to note that actually some of the fines around those compliance and enforcement provisions are actually proposed to be increased and strengthened in this proposed legislation. And as noted earlier, the Impact Assessment Act also allows the provision an establishment of monitoring committees to be community-based or indigenous-led to help support uh, the agency in, in monitoring the ongoing implementation of the project and identifying whether those conditions have been met. Great. Well, we have run out of time. We have so many questions we didn't even get a chance to get to. Definitely a timely and interesting topic to many, many people. Thank you, Christine for your great presentation and for taking time today to answer as many of the questions as you possibly could. Um, I invite all of you to uh, complete a survey, a very brief survey as you exit the webinar today. We are always looking for your feedback. In a day or two, you will receive a, an email with a link to the recording. And also, you will be able to uh, link to the, the attachments, the slides, and the, the handout will also be there. At that same site, you can also sign up for our next webinar, which will be on reforming environmental permit and review process using that case study in El Salvador. So we know your time is valuable, and we hope that this has been valuable to you. See you next time.